What's going on, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Memorial Day weekend is officially over with. I was on vacation all weekend, and me and my friends couldn't stop dabbing. I don't know why. I know it's like two years late. That means we're getting back to the videos. We're getting back to the channel. More fantasy football coming at you. It is almost June. Is it June yet? No, it's Tuesday, May 30th, but we're almost officially into the summer season, so I want to kick off my series. I'm going every single NFL team breaking down their fantasy football outlook for 2017. Today, we are going to kick it off number one on the list. The first team in the entire series in the NFC East, the New York football G-men. Now, what I'm going to be doing throughout the series is breaking down their entire offense in a fantasy perspective. Quarterback situation, the running back situation, wide receivers, tight ends, anything that's fantasy relevant is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be taking my own takes on every single team and every player that's relevant in fantasy. G-men. Now, just a reminder, these videos, I'm doing a blog post as well for every single one of them. So any of these videos that you want to watch can also be found in written form on the website, which I'll link in every video below. And if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you go do that. It's at B-D-G-E-A-T fantasy. And I know this is pretty early in the off season, so things are definitely going to change, but I did my best to kind of give my perspective on what it is now. And I have 32 of these to write, 32 of these to record, so I figured I had to get started. And I already have about 20 of the blog posts written. I haven't published any of them, but I want to go day by day doing a new one every day. And these first few were written before the NFL draft, so I added in pieces as the off season was going on, and I probably will update the blog posts as the off season rolls. But without further ado, let us start off the first episode of this series. And it's an easier way for you to narrow down things. So if you're looking for a specific player, you know, you want to hear an outlook on, on just one guy, like a running back on the Ravens or something like that, you can just go search my channel for Ravens Outlook. And there, within that video, you'll hear a breakdown of, of all the players and all the situations that they're in, rather than having to go through all the other YouTube videos that say like top five sleepers, things like that, that may or may not be the guy that you're looking for. All right, so let's kick it off. Quarterback position in New York, we have Eli Manning, top 10 fantasy quarterback 2014, 2015, took a huge step back in 2016, finished as QB 21, was tied for fourth in the NFL with 16 interceptions. Uh, he's always pretty high up there in those numbers, but he didn't look good last year. He had erratic throws all over the field. He was not managing the game well, and it showed pretty big. And, and you can't blame the O-line because they were actually the second ranked offensive line per football outsiders. Let me see. He was ranked 24th amongst quarterbacks in completions per aimed throw. And a quote from Ben McAdoo was, straight up, Eli needs to do a better job of playing with fast feet. And I think he needs to sit on that back foot in the pocket. It, it's not good when uh, you know the quarterback starts getting older and their form starts breaking down. That's usually something you'd see in first or second year quarterbacks, not towards the end of your career. That's usually a sign of decline in physical play and physical performance. So in a real life football situation, obviously Eli's, uh, Eli's career is going to be capped soon. I would say he's got another two to three years with average production for the team in both fantasy and in real life. But one takeaway I would definitely say from last year is the defense of the Giants absolutely clicked and dominated last year towards the end of the season or the second half of the season. So it's something that I'm sure we'll see going into 2017. They're going to be a very, very, very heavy defensive-mindedly team. And teams that are, are heavily uh, reliant on defenses usually take that into account when they're playing offense. You know, the teams with the best defenses usually try to control the clock. They use a lot of ground and pound. They use a lot of rushing attempts on that side of the ball. So I think that's something else that will take away from Eli's ceiling there, and which is not very, very high to begin with. I do love the addition of Brandon Marshall and uh, their rookie pick, Evan Ingram, to that side of the ball. That being said, it's not going to make him a more accurate player. But um, overall, you know, I, I see him kind of sitting in between the QB 12 to 16 range in fantasy for 2017. And since we just touched on their new addition of Brandon Marshall, we'll continue into that avenue. Now, B. Marsh is coming over from the other New York team. The Jets obviously had a terrible year. He was like a consensus top 10 pick in fantasy or top 15 pick, and I had him on a ton of my team, so he fucking killed me. I still don't think it was his fault. When you watch him play last year, when you watch his tape, he had some bad drops, but in terms of speed, agility, quickness, route running, and those things, there was no different performance there. 
He's 33, so he's getting up there in age, but I still didn't see anything that says to me his physical capabilities or his play is on the down slope. The key stat, if you're gonna take away anything from this or anything I say about Brandon Marshall all off season is that 44% of his throws to him last year, 44% of the targets he got to himself last year were catchable, were deemed catchable by I think pro football focus. What are you gonna do if you're getting 130 targets? Sure, from the outside you could say the volume is there, he should have produced, but if, if less than 50% of those balls are catchable, what are you supposed to do in a fantasy fantasy perspective of things? Like, there's nothing to do there. So, you know, when you look at the Giants, they haven't had a real elite red zone target like Marshall since Plaxico Burris back in the day before he shot himself out of the league. And him and Eli, were they were nice together, especially near the end zone, especially near the red zone in that 10 zone. And that's a, that's a term I'm gonna be using that I'm stealing from the fantasy footballers. Instead of talking about the red zone, we're gonna be talking about the 10 zone. So anything from 10 into the goal line. You know, I, I definitely don't see B. Marsh getting back to his elite years of, of 1,400 yards or anything like that, but I think a double digit scores is, is eight to 12 scores is definitely realistic in my book. They've been forcing passes into smaller guys like Odell, Sterling Shepard. They haven't had a big target like Brandon Marshall, like I said, since Plaxico Burris. And I think he's a huge addition. I don't think he's lost a step. And I think he'll get the targets there, even though he's obviously the clear number two behind Odell, which leads us to Odell. The young ramen noodle-headed wide receiver from LSU who's been dominating the fantasy landscape, been dominating NFL for the last few years since he's came in the league. I don't see any of these new additions of of targets to Eli's weapon, weaponry, hurting Odell whatsoever. Still arguably the most talented wide receiver in the NFL, will keep getting his targets. Same thing I've touched on Brandon Cooks in, in my previous uh, videos. Odell is one of maybe three guys in the NFL that can turn a five, eight yard slant into a 90 yard touchdown. That's a game breaker in every sense. Uh, Odell's not gonna lose that from his game. Now he's not gonna be the first wide receiver off the board for me. That still goes to Antonio Brown, but I think once you get to the second, third wide receiver, it's a toss up between him and Julio. Personally, I still think I'm gonna go Julio over Odell this year, just because of the addition of the weapons. But you know, I ain't gonna be mad at you if you take Odell over Julio. And I wanna leave you, he won't go outside of the top five picks. And David Johnson, Le'Veon, Zeke, not, in no particular order, Antonio Brown, and then a toss up between Julio and Odell most likely. So top five, six, he's gonna be in 95% of drafts. I'm gonna leave you with one stat before I go from Pro Football Focus. No wide receiver has averaged as many fantasy points per game over his first three NFL seasons as a Odell Beckham, and he paces the runner-up, Randy Moss, by more than two full fantasy points per game. So as we move down the pass receiving list, we have Sterling Shepard was the clear number two guy there behind Odell last year. <laughs> this is who I definitely think gets hurt the most in this offseason. You know, he, he had a good, not a great rookie season. His numbers were mostly inflated by the eight total touchdowns that he had, which I think are definitely going to be coming back down to earth a little bit. He had only one game of over 75 receiving yards all season, and he managed only 10.5 yards per reception. So that's under guys like Danny Amendola and Cole Beasley, like true, true slot guys. So now he's just a, a slot receiver on a team that already has an elite playmaker, added Evan Ingram, and now also added Brandon Marshall, who are those red zone targets. You know, like Sterling Shepard prospered last year because of all those red zone targets he got and all those touchdowns he scored. And now they have true, true, you know, 10 zone targets that those touchdown throws are most likely gonna be going to. That kills his 10 zone targets as well as just his overall targets, you know? So you look at the position that Shepard will probably take over, which is that, you know, that slot position. And Victor Cruz was in that role last year and Cruz saw 72 targets in 14 games. So it's five targets a game. Shepard had 6.6 .6 targets a game last year. So I think when you look at him taking over that role, adding the two new additions to the offense, that number is gonna dip down by you know, 6.6, .6, probably around a five, if not lower, which really hurts his fantasy value. So I don't think he's being overdrafted, underdrafted. I just, I don't, there's not a lot of ceiling there for Shepard. Now we move over to the tight end position, one that's not been a great thing for the G-men. They had David Njoku on the board still when it was their pick. They didn't go with him, which it almost upset me. I don't know why I cared so much because I don't really care about the Giants, but I wish he would have been picked. Uh, instead, they went with Evan Ingram. He's 6'3", 235 out of Texas A&M. He's undersized as a tight end at 6'3", 235. He's a terrible blocker, we'll put it that way, and they picked him to move him around the offense. All the reports are saying that throughout the offseason training, he's just been moving around all 
parts of the offense, backfield, slot, outside, and that's how they're gonna use him. They're gonna use him as a mismatcher behind the linebackers and the safeties and people that try to come up and cover him. So and when you look at um, how well will he fit into this offense, like is there enough opportunity? My intuition says no. And it just goes back to having Odell and Brandon Marshall on the outside. When you look at where Ingram can really cause the mismatches, it's over the middle, obviously, but it's near the 10 zone where most tight ends, if they do make a big impact in their rookie year, you look at like Hunter Henry last year, it's because he had a high touchdown total. And and any young tight end usually doesn't put up huge receiving yards. They'll put up big touchdown numbers, and that's what makes them valuable. Marshall and Odell Beckham were tied for fourth. Fourth most red zone targets in the NFL in 2016. They both had 21. And the Giants tight end position combined to see only five targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line last year. So they don't utilize the tight end near the end zone there. Ingram should have his big games. I could see a few like five, five catches, 80 yards receiving lines, uh, but I, it's not gonna be consistent and I don't think those touchdown numbers are gonna be there given that they already have the weapons on the outside. You know, he's someone that you can get late in drafts, obviously he's someone that You'd like to um, you'd like to have for a dynasty league, or if you can get them late and you're in a keeper league, that's cool too. I'm not going to be mad at that. But take the two rookie tight ends that went before him, OJ Howard and David Njoku, in uh, the fantasy football sense of things before him. All right, so now we're getting into the run game. Now let me look at this because I wrote this a little while ago. So Rashad Jennings is out. He had over 45% of the Giants' carries last season, and now it looks like it's Paul Perkins' backfield to lose, at least for early down touches. Now, Perkins averaged 4.1 yards per carry uh, compared to Jennings 3.3 on a team that, that didn't have a good run blocking line. So Perkins did a lot w without being given a lot. Now, you had NJ Advanced Media's James Cratch said Paul Perkins is the Giants' clear-cut number one running back after they released Jennings. Uh, now, Perkins is 5'10", 208. He's a fifth rounder, um, and he wasn't used a lot in the beginning of the year in 2016, but he really came, he came on down the stretch, and he saw 15.4 touches over... New York's final five games, including that playoff L to the Packers. Shane Vereen wasn't much of a factor in 2016 after tearing his steps, but he took a pay cut in March so that he could stay with the team, which is, yeah, that's pretty cool. And the way I look at it is the Giants added Shane Drone. I'm sure how to say his last name. Perkins is a good athlete, right? Good athlete. He can do it all. He can run. He can block. He can catch the ball. Unfortunately, Shane Vereen's a much better pass catcher, so it's hard to say that Perkins has really any potential to be the three full featured back, you know, three down back there. So I see Vereen taking over that spot for sure. Uh, Drone is, is more of a depth play. So talking about the running back situation, you obviously have to talk about the rookie that they drafted, Wayne Gallman. He got taken in the fourth round, pick 140 overall by the Giants. He's six foot, 215, so a really good size for a running back. He's out of Clemson. He had really, really good numbers at Clemson. He's not a great athlete, ran a 4.640. He's more of like a grinder kind of guy. He, uh, he'll, he'll push for extra yards. He doesn't make guys miss. He's not great at avoiding tackles. He'll, he'll add those one or two extra yards after contact that keeps kind of rolling forward. So the way I see Gallman, you'll hear articles all, this, is, this goes for any rookie running back. In the age of Twitter and in the age of blogging, when it comes to fantasy football, you'll hear hype about every single, you'll, you'll hear a sleeper article about every single rookie running back drafted this year in the draft. Wayne Gallman, not excluded. In my opinion, he's not a great running back. Uh, after watching him play a little bit, after watching a little bit of his tape, he's someone that they may use near the goal line because Perkins is a little undersized compared to Wayne Gallman. Now I'm going to look up some of the 10 zone stats for Perkins right now. So Rashad Jennings had seven carries inside the five, turned three of them into touchdowns. Shane Vereen had three. Arlene's Darkwad, three. Paul Perkins only had one carry inside the five yard line. So it looks to me, obviously he didn't get a lot of play in the beginning of the year, but it looks to me like they're not going to be using Perkins too much down by the end zone. So what you have here is basically Perkins as the early down back, Shane Vereen as the pass catching role, and then Gallman's kind of like a, a, a breather for Perkins and possibly the goal line back. We'll have yet to see what they, what they want to do down there. We'll look up some ADPs right now so we can talk about this. Paul Perkins is going 80th overall as running back 30 right now. 
I actually really like that. I think that's a good value play for someone that can give you solid RB2 numbers. Like I said, he's a good athlete, so he's going to catch some balls too. But I think when it comes to main receiving down, Shane Vereen is going to be that guy. Paul Perkins certainly has 35, 40 reception upside though in that offense that slings the ball a lot. And remember, like I said, they're defensive minded teams, so they're going to be looking to run the ball more now. Perkins is the top guy in that backfield. And then the next running back off the board, Shane Vereen's not going until 215 overalls. So he's, him and Gallman are over 200, so they're basically free to draft. Vereen's a steal in a PPR league, so he's good value. The only ones I'd be taking in this backfield are definitely Perkins and Shane Vereen. I really, if you're going wide receiver early, you want to go wide receiver, wide receiver, tight end, something like that, and you're looking for later round running backs, I really like Perkins where he's going. So that really kind of wraps it up for this first episode of the 2017 fantasy team outlooks, New York Giants. We're gonna keep going division by division, so next up will be one of the other NFC East teams. If you enjoyed, please give the video a thumbs up. Go follow me on Twitter, linked below. Go subscribe to my newsletter on my blog, which I'll also link below. If you're looking for any team gear for your fantasy football league this summer, I'm talking about draft boards, I'm talking about championship belts, I'm talking about rings, trophies, whatever you want. FantasyJocks.com is the place to be. I have the link below. I have an affiliate link, so if you order through me, I got a little kickback. I know, like, if I'm watching a video and someone said that shit, I'd be like, I'm just not gonna go through the affiliate link now just because you said that shit, because I'm a, I'm a butt hole. But I would appreciate if, if you're gonna order something, go through the affiliate link. If you found it through me, that'd be cool. If not, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that's it. So again, subscribe to the channel if you're new. I hope you enjoyed. Peace, big dogs. I need a jersey for myself. What's next? I'm nervous for myself. If I change, I became a better version of myself. Bought a chain, bought two more. Yeah, I deserve that for myself. And my neighbors look at me like how he purchased that himself. Cause I'm a seven figure, self made nigga.